yes to peace. No to NATO, 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 yes to peace. There we go. Keep marching there, Andy. We've had, a, we've had great events over the last four days now. We started on Friday night right here in Best Boys and Poets where we had a meet and greet for everybody that was in town coming in from all over the world for this. And in fact, right now I see people from France that are here. Yay! Yay. Vive la France! Bravo! Bravo! of information besides the books that we have for you. Then on, so Friday we had Veterans for Peace, the Peace Walk, they were in here. Saturday we had a great, great symposium, all day long symposium, and then yesterday we had a hotter than hell rally at the White House. So how many of you all have attended one or more of those events? Yay! Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thanks for your solidarity. Yay. And today there have been a lot of things that have been happening in Washington, D.C. as the heads of state of 32 na nations are here in town that are official members of NATO, and then there are all sorts of partners of NATO that are here, primarily from Asia and the Pacific because they're trying to widen out NATO not just North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but a global, global network. So they've invited Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. So we've had a, events today that we've been protesting NATO. We'll have them tomorrow uh, and the next day. So we hope that you can join us at the Convention Center tomorrow and other places to include the White House tomorrow night, State Department tomorrow night, and Fort McNair for the Department of Defense, where all of the heads of these various entities of the 32 nations are meeting with the U.S. representatives. In each one of our events, we've started off with wonderful music to get us in the mood for thinking about how to challenge NATO and imperialism around the world. So let's have a big round of applause for Uncle Sam. Oh, whoops. Maybe we should just introduce him as Ben Gossip, the wonderful, wonderful singer that we have. And I am feeling sad and upset today. You know, it's been 75 years of work that I put into building the Transatlantic Alliance, NATO. And today, you know, I was all excited about the convention today and all the work I put in over the last 75 years. But you know what? I was feeling internally so upset that I had to call my therapist. And this is what I told him. So what brought me here, shrink, is I started to think that perhaps I've gone into decline. I almost forget when the sun never set on countries whose rules I define. My unrivaled power meant nations would cower and help my vast wealth to accrue. If one wasn't supine, where were they got? Just me. 
makes me irate when erstwhile client states demand that I honor their borders. I feel anxious and sick, check the diagnostic manual of mental disorders. Amen. 
enforce its global rule. Now it's bombing pipelines where allies once got fuel. NATO domination brings hunger, war, and fear. But there's cracks in the foundation, and NATO's end is near. Remember what happened at Jericho? The trumpets began to sound. Joshua commanded the people to shout, and the walls came tumbling down. We say NATO's got to go, got to go, got to go. We say NATO's got to go, so the people can live in peace. We say NATO's got to go. Summit all about. I know this is 75 years, so it must be some big 
uh, some big important year, obviously, for, for having this gathering. So can you tell us what's happening in the convention center right now? I'd be, I'd be curious to know from all of you. Well, I think um, what Andy said about the traffic is interesting because uh, anywhere you try to go where these people are having a forum, it is just surrounded by fences. Raise your hand if you tried to get somewhere today and were, uh, you just, barriers everywhere. Um, you know, in the, in the past, when NATO comes to somebody's town because it's rotating, uh, there are protests. And according to the US, we're supposed to even have this great democracy where we have access and ability to exercise our First Amendment rights be within sight and sound of where the events are taking place, and yet you can't get anywhere near the summit. And uh, yesterday before it started, I went over to the Marriott, which is right by the convention center, and saw a big sign that said, public forum for NATO. And I thought, aha, okay, they're gonna have their closed session private forum, and then there's a public forum. So I went in to try to sign up for the public forum. And what was so interesting is there was a sign there who were the sponsors of the public forum. And of course, there were weapons companies like Northrop Grumman, like Boeing, like Lockheed Martin. And when I went in to ask for a credential, they weren't speaking English. And they were um, people that were dressed in a lot of blue and yellow. So I wondered, uh, is this a Ukrainian forum? And indeed, they were Ukrainians, and they were organizing this public forum for NATO. And it turns out it's not a public forum at all. It's by invitation only to, uh, and then the public can watch it online. And that's what we're seeing for all of these other uh, events is you can watch it online and that's what makes it public. But they want to make sure that the people who are there are people who have bought into the agenda. And a lot of the agenda in this particular uh, anniversary is about Ukraine. It is about keeping a war going that could have, one, never started if Ukraine hadn't expanded to Russia's border and two, could have been stopped a month after it started if indeed there was an effort to negotiate, which there was. There was a plan that was laid out, a 15-point plan, uh, where the Russians and the Ukrainians were agreeing to. And the most important part, piece of that plan is that you, the Ukraine would be a neutral country which means it would not join NATO. That was number one. And Zelensky at that time agreed to it and was ready to convince the people of Ukraine that that was necessary in order to end the war. But then the US and the UK came in and said, no, we won't agree to that. We, in fact, had Secretary Austin the defense uh, from the United States who came to his position as Secretary of Defense. From where? Where was he? The Board of Raytheon before he became Secretary of Defense. And he said that we would use this opportunity of the war to weaken Russia. And that's what they have been trying to do. And in the meantime, it is us, the taxpayers, in both the US and in Europe, the NATO countries that are paying the bill for the effort by the NATO leaders to quote weaken Russian, keep the war going, find a new purpose for NATO, which is what the Russian invasion did. And I think we should condemn very strongly the Russian invasion and uh, including the horrific attack that just happened on the children's hospital. But we have to say, that what we want is negotiations. What we want is to find a way to end that war and not to continue to pour 
billions and billions of dollars. And so for the US, we just passed a package of $60 billion to go to Ukraine to keep that war going. And at this NATO summit, what they want to do is to make sure there is a commitment for 40 billion euros, which is about $43 billion of the United States, to be going to, Na to uh, Ukraine to keep this war going indefinitely. And so as we talk tonight, and Seven, who is representing uh, Europe and what is happening to European economies and how this is playing out politically as well, um, to understand that in Europe, I think there is a lot more opposition to spending more and more of the gross domestic product on war, which is what NATO's goal is. You know, they want you to spend 2% of the GDP on war, which might sound like a little, but it actually is an enormous amount of money. And the NATO countries and Biden are bragging that they have pulled Europe into this militarism so much so that now 23 of the 32 countries of NATO are indeed spending at least 2% of their GDP on the military, which means they're taking it away from healthcare, education, infrastructure, and addressing the climate crisis. So what they're doing, I think, is criminality. What they're doing is keeping us on a horrific treadmill of war that could lead to World War III, could lead to a nuclear war, and is robbing us, as Eisenhower said back in 1960, robbing us of the money that we need to attend to the people's needs here at home and around the planet. Thank you. I, I want to say before, before, you know, um, before we, uh, we continue, I wanted to, I don't think we did appropriate introductions uh, for you guys, especially for some of them who uh, many people may not know and may not know her background. So I wanted to let Anne introduce her uh, properly. Okay. Yes, we were going a little fast right there. And uh, my apologies because we have with us a member of the German parliament, the Bundestag, for 20 years she's been a member of, of their parliament. She has been on the NATO parliamentary assembly, so she has been at various times within the NATO structure. Uh, she served on the committees in the Bundestag for India, for China, and for the United States. So she brings to us a huge amount of, of background in NATO and around the world. And we are so pleased that she is saying also no to NATO. Thank you. There we go. And, and one other thing, she was also the first MP to visit uh, Julian Assange at the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. In 2012. So thank you for being such an important voice. Uh, I also want to, say, you know, I know a lot of people know, know David and know Medea, but uh, everyone knows, knows Medea. She's an author of almost 11 books. Is this the 11th or 12th? Who knows? You must count. When you go like this, you've never written too many books, right? Uh, so she's the author of 11 books, and of course she's in Congress every single day. We see the tweets, we see the reels every single day, and it's really heartwarming to see people keeping that pressure on uh, in our Congress. And uh, she's just an amazing human being, so it's great to have you here. And David Swanson, of course, many of you know David. He's author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He's executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org. Um, his book, uh, which he did here, uh, was, is War is a Lie, and his other book is When the World Outlawed War. He has a blog, DavidSwanson.org, so please follow him. Thank you. So I wanted to turn to you, Seven, for, for, for a minute. I know uh, that there's a, the summit happening here, and it's odd that the day before the summit that there would be such a uh, increase in assault uh, on Kiev and uh, from from Russia. Uh, what do you think the Russians are thinking? Is it, it was it intentional to sort of uh, come at this time? Uh, are what's what's why do you think this happened at this moment, where this increased attack yeah. that happened from Russia against Ukraine, where they hit the hospital? And you know, made headlines, of course, here. Of course, well, we've been hitting hospitals in Gaza every day, so uh, yeah, that's a whole, whole different story. Yeah. But before I start, yes. I just want to uh, uh, add uh, two things. 
One, uh, first, thank you all uh, for coming and thanks for having me. Unfortunately, the left my publisher left World Books. Uh, they gave it to print. The the book was uh, published in Germany beginning of April this year, uh, right in time for the official uh, 75th anniversary of the NATO. And then immediately uh, went to the translation and editing and so on. And it became in Germany a bestseller uh, from the Spiegel magazine. It's like um, being a bestseller here at, uh, in the New York Times list. So um, yeah. I was very, <laughs> Uh, not that I think that it's uh, uh, so uh, so important, but I do think I do believe in one thing that that makes uh, th this is a proof that criticism on NATO is not unpopular in Germany, even though you have such a propaganda for the NATO, for the war machine, for warmongering, it's not unpopular. Uh, actually, the uh, the controversy is uh, is the fact. It became very, uh, uh, very fast, real bestseller, and uh, and uh, I do hope uh, that many more books uh, on on the NATO critics on NATO could get to more popular. Uh, so the left word books uh, they got in print last week. Uh, the print is in New York. I thought they could make it uh, to Washington D.C. Uh, maybe NATO intervened. I don't know. So. <laughs> Uh, but I, I do hope uh, that we will have it at the book launch on Friday at People's Forum in New York City. And I hope uh, Buzzbuzz and Poets can, can order it and people can pre-order it at uh, Left World Books. Where so the book is available. The, the, the book is available in English. So uh, this is the first thing. The second thing is um, you asked what is going on now at the NATO summit. I just want to say one thing. 75 years for an organization is not something uh, natural. It's not self, uh, something what is uh, automatically happening to organizations like, you know, the NATO, like an inter international organization. So 75 years is something um, special, and uh, that's why I thought uh, I have to, I have to do a reckoning with all the great myths of the NATO. Uh, the three great moves are uh, that NATO is a defensive alliance, a defense alliance, that NATO is an alliance of uh, rules-based uh, uh, states uh, w which are um, respecting international law and uh, human rights. And the third one, which is not so much in the Anglo-Saxon uh, discussion, but it is in Europe, always, when you talk about NATO, they always talk about NATO as an alliance of values. It's an alliance what, what values human rights and is defending human rights. And I think all these three myths uh, are not, um, uh, don't stand the reality. That's why I thought it's important to, uh, to make a reckoning, to write a reckoning. And the other thing is, I do believe that uh, NATO you know, they are all celebrating now the 75th year of the NATO. They are celebrating and uh, trying to cover up all the contradictions they have, all the crises they are facing, and trying to, to give the impression that everything is all right and uh, they have, they, they, they standing on the hill to celebrate 75 years of NATO. But I do believe NATO does not stand on a hill but they, uh, but up to the neck in a swamp. That's the fact. Uh, uh, that, that the, that's the reality NATO is uh, facing because of their rearmament, because of their endless wars, because of their escalation policy, their um, expansion policy towards Asia against uh, China, and on the other side, because of the rearmament. Uh, they are doing a social war against their own populations. Medea just mentioned um, what 2% uh, GDP means. 2% GDP in Germany means more than 90 billion per year for NATO, for wars, for weapons, and so on. And I just want to give you one figure to compare the, the budget for uh, healthcare in the German uh, government, in the German state, is just 16 billion, 16 billion. And they cut it, one third of this budget, they cut it 
So it was uh, 16 uh, billion is now one third less than it was last year. And the reason is just simple. The reason is because we are transferring money and uh, more money and uh, weapons and more heavier weapons to Ukraine to fuel the war. So if you, and, and everyone knows if you have one dollar, you can just spend it once. You know, you, you can't spend it to Ukraine and then spend it for education, infrastructure, or health, or uh, an accurate uh, housing for the people. So that's what we are facing. And because we are facing this, the criticism, uh, it, it, it is rising in Germany. So 55% of the German population, they do not want to um, defend other member states of the NATO. And this is Article 5 of the NATO Treaty is the heart of the NATO as an alliance, as a collective. The, to, to, to defend, to say every member state, you know, all for one and uh, one for all, every member state has to stand up and defend the other member state. And if a population, the majority of the population in a country says, we are not wi willing to defend another country, they actually say, we are not willing to accept the, the heart of the uh, NATO Charter, of the NATO Treaty. So that's why I think uh, criticism on NATO, doubts on NATO about their own legends, that they are a defense alliance or alliance of uh, human rights, uh, that, that this, is, uh, this is rising. And uh, the, th the third point you asked me about uh, why the Russians now are attacking uh, a, a hospital I don't know, I'm not the Russian Federation, uh, but I do know one thing, that in war times, in war zones, something like this is happening. And whoever is against this attack, against the hospital, must be in favor of a ceasefire and a replacement. And I just don't, and I just don't understand the logic. Everyone who's criticizing this attack of Russia and Ukraine is saying we have to send more weapons. Sending more weapons kills more people. You know, if you want to stop a war, you have to send diplomats, not weapons to a country. And that's, that's a very simple, simple, uh, simple uh, logic. And um, besides the, the fact of this hypocrisy, I mean, you know, killing 15,000 children, 15,000 children in Gaza, uh, bombing hospitals, bombing schools, bombing uh, refugee camps. This is not a problem. They, they, they don't say any word of arming the Palestinians against the aggression of, uh, of Israel, for example, but they, uh, but they are very loud on criticizing Russia now because of this attack. Of course, I condemn this attack as well. I condemn the aggression of Russia as well because it's a very clear breach of international law. It's a very clear. I don't say it's, uh, it's, uh, it was unprovoked, but it is a breach of international law and we have to condemn this. But uh, on the other way, I say, uh, if, you, if you're really interested of stopped, uh, stopping uh, uh, of uh, stopping the killings in Ukraine, you have to be in favor of negotiations and uh, and a ceasefire. And I'm afraid that at the NATO summit, it's the whole um, contrary what's going on there because there are three parts of this NATO summit we have to uh, consider. The one is uh, the working group meeting to think about sending more weapons, more heavier weapons to. Ukraine, that kind of happens which Ukraine can use or should use now on Russian territory. We do have German, very insane politicians. They even say uh, Ukraine has to have the capability to attack ministries, ministries in, uh, in, in Moscow. They want to give them the, the weapons which can really attack ministries of the government in, in Moscow. Uh, the second is that um, that you have the meeting NATO plus Ukraine, the NATO-Ukraine uh, council is meeting. 
for uh, for their strategic plans, how to escalate this war. And the third one uh, is the uh, NATO plus uh, uh, Asian Pacific War. Uh, it's about the expansion, the NATOization of Asia against uh, China. And I really, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about the third one because uh, that can lead very easily to a third world war. And that's why China is, at the moment, they already they already criticize what's going on here at the summit and uh, criticize that they are now uh, having the negotiations on the communique of the NATO where they want to mention China in an aggressive way. How, how, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How popular is your voice in the uh, in the parliament? How many other members of the parliament uh, stand behind you uh, or really. alongside you? Yeah, uh, maybe not uh, behind me, but uh, behind the criticism on NATO, um, it's well, it's difficult. I mean, uh, I'm a member of parliament from the Zara Wagenknecht Alliance. We just uh, found this party. Uh, we have been members of the German left party, the Linke, in the past, and uh, we, we left the party last year. Um, one major reason why we did leave the left party was that they were in favor of the sanctions, that means the economic war against Russia. Um, I'm against it because I think sanctions are weapons of mass destruction and we shouldn't uh, support. The other thing is, um, the other thing is uh, uh, partly they are in, uh, in favor of weapon deliveries to Ukraine and, uh, and this is totally the, uh, contrary to that what is in the program set uh, in the left party, which I did right, partly. So uh, that's why we left uh, the left party and built a new uh, party. It's called uh, Zara Wagenknecht Alliance, uh, Reason and Justice. And um, we had our Congress in January uh, this year, uh, our founding Congress. Uh, and, um, and we had uh, the first national elections at the European parliamentary elections and won six seats in the European parliament. It was a big success for us because uh, being six months old as a party and facing such a, such a challenge for the, for the elections was uh, very tough and we are very happy and now we are, um, we are looking for the next coming elections. And our criticism of NATO is very clear. Uh, there is, uh, the left party is still criticizing officially uh, still, uh, but there are some voices who say after the attack on Ukraine, uh, something is been shifting without the left in whole Europe, actually. So even some left persons are thinking maybe it's not that bad to be in a military alliance or military back uh, as a protection uh, from Russia. Uh, what I think is very insane. I mean, you, they must be insane to think about attacking a, a member state of the NATO, Russia. And that's why I don't believe that they, are, uh, that they have any plans on this. But on the right, uh, we do have uh, the far right party AfD in the German parliament. They are in the opposition and they are criticizing not NATO itself. They voted in favor of the enlargement regarding Finland and Sweden, unfortunately. Uh, and they are uh, in favor of 2% of GDP for NATO expenses. And, uh, and, uh, but they are uh, against the enlargement with uh, Ukraine. And, uh, and we have still in the governmental party, Social Democrats, some voices who are against the membership of, uh, of the NATO, uh, of, of Ukraine in the NATO, because they know that, that, uh, this, will, that, that this will bring, uh, uh, br bring us to the brink of uh, World War III against uh, Russia. So some of them are, are uh, reasonable still. Uh, but the most important is that in the population is different, different, uh, different. So it's the same like in the US. You have a transatlantic media, transatlantic politicians. They are serving not for the majority of the people. They are serving for you know, uh, the military industrial complex. 
or for some other lobby organizations, transatlantic lobby organization. That's why I'm saying the German government is a very good example mm. for being a vessel state for the United States. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I want to turn to you, David, for a second. I think Sabin mentioned that you know the idea of sending arms only kills more people. Why are we sending diplomats instead? That seems logical. I think everyone would agree here that it makes a lot more sense and certainly a lot cheaper to be able to send diplomats than it would be to uh, continue to arm have people. You seen some, have you seen some of their bar bills? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, can you tell us who's benefiting from all this? Who's benefiting from this alliance? And why are member states, because I think the book speaks very clearly that the U.S. calls the shots when it comes to NATO. Why are member states willing to be kind of subservient to U.S. interests? Can you speak a little bit about that? And then I'm going to let you guys do this, I'm going to eat my sandwich. <laughs> well, I think the first answer to the last question is not through a democratic process. Uh, people are not surveyed in nations on whether uh, they support their government uh, bowing before the dictates of NATO. Uh, when NATO comes and badgers a government to spend more on weapons and less on people, uh, in no case that I'm aware of has the government gone to the people and said, good idea, bad idea, what do you want? Never happened. Uh, why do the governments themselves uh, make themselves subservient to NATO and to the United States? Uh, I think in part because they're made up of individuals who see their own individual interest uh, right. in that and who are considerably corrupt. Uh, I mean, NATO is principally a weapons-dealing organization. This was the big announcement today. They're gonna make more missiles and sell more missiles. This is, this is what NATO does. Um, I think, uh, I can't read my own writing. Uh, I, I, I think, to your other point, Andy, about why would Russia do something so stupid as to send missiles into Kyiv the day before NATO's going to meet and decide how much exactly it hates Russia. Uh, you know, I think there is an element of it used to be called in relation to nuclear standoff MAD, mutually assured destruction. There's, there's a sort of a mutually uh, provoked militarism. I, I mean, we know from the from the earlier part of the Cold War, specific incidents of Soviets and U.S. militarists helping the others uh, in very timely ways to boost military spending by the so-called enemy or opponent. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know the thinking of Belarus when they threatened to use nukes the day before a NATO summit. I don't know the thinking behind announcing their Chinese troops doing drills in, in Belarus. Well, you know, the same among us are saying NATO's out of its mind. China is not in Europe. Why put China in Europe? You know, uh, and I and I don't. But I do know that. The weapons dealers and the authoritarian government officials that are subservient principally to weapons dealers and secondarily to Joe Biden, who's running the world, uh, benefit from conflict, benefit from aggravation, benefit from increased hostility. Um, and my God, do they love that alliance of values thing, right? Because you can't say... China's a threat because it builds too many toasters. And you can't say China's a threat because it's actually attacking the United States. But you can say China's threatening our values. And you don't even have to explain what it means. You don't even have to know what it means. God knows Joe Biden doesn't know what it means. But, but they say it, right? They say it all the time. Um, I think principally what NATO does is, is propaganda, is education, is indoctrination. And what they've done and what they're doing here in this town is normalizing the idea that the more money you have, the more you should spend it on weapons as a public service, as your duty as a good global citizen, which is absolute insanity. Um, I, I think the other thing they're doing, of course, 
is trying to thread this needle on Ukraine where they pretend that they're letting Ukraine in and they're not letting Ukraine in. So what they're doing now apparently is crafting a statement that will say that the process could take weeks, could take centuries of letting Ukraine in is irreversible. Right. Sort of like dementia. And <laughs> it's nonsense. It's meaningless, right? It means that they want to keep the war going. They don't want a negotiated settlement. They want to keep the hostility and the fighting going, if not escalated. But they don't want to let Ukraine in. Why? Because they haven't been able to badger every NATO member to agree to it because it's insanity, right? Because it, you know, it risks all life on Earth. Um, so is, is, is continuing the war kind of a, uh, an audition for Zelensky? to be able to enter into NATO? Well, I think Zelensky is willing to be the sort of privatizing everything, selling out to Washington in every way government. The problem isn't Zelensky. The problem is that not every NATO member government wants to destroy all life on Earth right away. They, they, <laughs> they want to you know, hold off a bit. They aren't that crazy, thank God. Um, the, the, the big story, uh, just to mention one final point, the big story for the corporate US media, and to some extent the world media that follows, is nothing to do with NATO, it's it's Biden. It's just Biden. Um, Medea and I did an interview the other day where, you know, they were a little bit interested in NATO, but principally as it impacts Biden, right? And I. I have been reading about how they want to give a test to Biden and see if he can count backwards by sevens and so this sort of nonsense. And I thought we could take the opportunity to give him a better test. Oh, we have one. I have a test for oh. Biden. Uh, five, five questions. You want to hear them? Yes. Yeah. I, I think this will tell us everything we need to know about whether he's fit for the job. Number one, did you believe that you had seen photos of beheaded babies. <laughs> Number two, when you are trying to decide what you've seen, do you examine your memory, your staff, the Israeli government, or MSNBC? <laughs> Number three, after this many years of pretending you opposed the war on Iraq, do you now believe that? And if so, when did you come to believe it? <laughs> Number four, you say that you're running the world and that you're doing it for democracy. Do you believe that the world has elected you to run the world? <laughs> and, and number five, this is the math part. If two old power mad sociopaths walk into an election, how many people survive a nuclear war? <laughs> so, a couple of comments. One, I wanted just how Orwellian uh, the thinking is at NATO now that they are trying to uh, make this commitment to Ukraine be, quote, Trump-proof. In case Trump comes in and says, ah, I don't feel like today I want to, you know, support NATO. They want to make sure that there's something in place that will guarantee that the U.S. continues to support NATO over the long term, whatever that long term might be. And so the outgoing Secretary General of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, said, the paradox is that the longer we plan, the longer we commit to war, the sooner Ukraine can have peace. Wow. <laughs> so, Sound very Orwellian. War is peace and peace is war, right? So how can they make this, this last through if Trump were to Well, so there's a bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Ukraine that's supposed to be a 10-year one. Of course, it doesn't have to last. Uh, and they are going to make this commitment at this uh, summit right now to say, uh, as I said earlier, that there will be this 40 billion euro commitment indefinitely um, to NATO. And uh, they're also building up this, in a US base in Germany called Weissen, 
Wiesbaden, Wiesbaden, uh, that will be the central command for controlling all of the military hardware and the training that will be done for uh, uh, Ukraine. And they said we'll have up to 700 staff people just for that. So they're putting in place all of the elements that will make sure that this war continues. But don't they have to have a Senate approval for something like that? Well, of course, they're supposed to have congressional approval any time that the U.S. gets involved in anything that can be called a war, but they don't call this a war because it's not U.S. troops on the ground, um, but it's everything else. It's U.S. machinery, it's U.S. intelligence, it's U.S. cover, uh, and it's U.S. pushing this war. So um, you brought up, David, about how uh, Biden speaking on behalf of the free world. Uh, I think it's quite remarkable that the outgoing Secretary General of the of NATO uh, spoke a couple of months back at a factory of Lockheed Martin where they're making these weapons that are going both to Ukraine and to Israel. And he said on behalf of the five billion people in the free world, <laughs> I thank you for the great job that you are doing, contributing to global freedom by making these weapons. So this is a this is a insanity, um, and this is the insanity that's happening right here in our city. Uh, it's happening with the two parties in agreement. But I do want to bring up something about this Trump-proof issue and divisions between the Democrats and Republicans. Because in general, we can say that we have two war parties, right? Yeah. But the Republicans tend to be a little more hawkish than the Democrats are. When there is a, um, a budget for the military, for the Pentagon, that comes from Biden and it's increased so that we're almost spending a trillion dollars, the Republicans will take it and say, it's not enough and they will add more. In fact, there's one person in the Republican Party who just added $25 billion more to the budget, single-handedly. So the Republicans are somewhat worse. And yet, when it comes to the issue of Ukraine, there is not one Democrat, think about this, there is not one Democrat in Congress, not one, that voted against sending $61 million of our taxes to Ukraine. Not one Democrat, not the squad, not Bernie Sanders, not any of them. And yet there were Republicans. And when we have been around, uh, Ann and I yesterday and myself today, interviewing, trying to interview members of Congress about what they think about NATO, every Democrat that I talked to said, NATO is absolutely important because Russia is an existential threat to us and the world, and we must keep up this military alliance. The only objections we got were a couple of Republicans, including Marjorie Taylor Greene, who some of you might know as a racist, a homophobe, all kinds of horrible things. And she said, I don't think NATO is helpful because I don't believe the US should be involved in foreign wars. So I'm just putting it out there because we are living in very strange times. And he also said, I don't care about anybody outside of the United States. And it's not exactly my perfect attitude. But, but, but better than I care oh, no. so much about them, I'm going to kill them. And he, but can I, can I say something about Trump proofing NATO? Because if you look at Biden's grandest accomplishment of his career, getting these nations to spend more money on weapons and building up NATO, Trump did more of that than Biden. The nation spending more money on the military to meet their NATO obligations has happened more under Trump and less under Biden. And but Biden took more credit for it at the debates. Just of, of course. And so Trump's spend more money or I'm going to tell Russia to attack you actually did NATO more good than Biden's spend more money or I'm going to mumble incoherently. Like That worked better, right? Trump who sent weapons into Ukraine that Obama wouldn't. Trump who kicked out the Russian 
diplomats, Trump who attacked Russian troops in Syria, Trump who tore up agreements with Russia, Trump who did everything you could possibly do as a good, russophobic, bigoted US president who hates Russia, who to this day, most of the US public believes actually worked for Russia, did more to build up NATO than Biden has done. And the person who did even more than Trump is Vladimir Putin. Right? Nothing has done more for NATO in its entire existence than Russia invading Ukraine. Absolutely predictable. Again, the madness of the vicious cycle where the Russian militarists do what they know is going to build up the Western militarists who counter with what they do know, with doing what they know is going to build up even more Russian militarism in this vicious cycle. And so this idea that you've got to You've got to Trump-proof this institution when they just had a debate where they argued, if at all, over who was going to get the Europeans to pay more for militarism, and they and they argued more than that over who has a better golf game. But that was the, that was the extent of the argument on the substance was I get the Europeans to pay more. No, I get the Europeans to pay more. Neither one of them said hey, maybe the Europeans know something, spending less on this insanity and more on human needs. Neither one of them said anything like that. So I have a question for Seven, uh, which is that uh, while we're talking now about internal politics in the United States, and let's also remember that the Republicans are way worse when it comes to China, uh, and um, that one of the reasons that people see or... Uh, analysts of right-wing think tanks talk about the importance of NATO is that we've got to keep Europe away from Russia and we've got to keep Europe away from China. So could you talk about those in the European context? I think um, maybe just first one thing uh, Andy was asking why all the other member states are so subservient to, to the US. Um, yeah, the, the NATO, the essence of the NATO is uh, a deal. It's, an, it's, an, it's a deal. Uh, they got uh, in the deal that the, the deal uh, has um, uh, protection for the European member states from the United States, from the biggest military force in the world and um, and the deal is that everyone is giving up their sovereignty that's the deal <laughs> I mean it's very simple and uh, that's why they're all doing what the United States are saying no one can decide in the NATO no one else than the United States they are deciding and even though the general secretary of the NATO is a European always that doesn't mean anything because the general secretary, they they uh, they are not that much important like uh, like the Sakur. The Sakur is a, it's a military pact. The NATO is the military pact, and the Sakur has the, is the command chief of the NATO army, and it's always always a U.S. American in person, always a U.S. American, and uh, this U.S. American, the Sakur is also always the commander of the United States forces in Europe. It's always one person, the same person. So um, from this structure actually, and if one member states wants to, wants to quit, wants to leave the NATO, they, don't, they, they, they cannot send a letter to the general secretary of the NATO and send them a letter and say, well, we, we, we think we, we are strong enough. We don't want to, to be in the military pact anymore. We are leaving the NATO. That doesn't work like this. You have to come to Washington, D.C. Yeah? This is the address. The address of, uh, of NATO is the United States. And n nothing, nothing can happen within, within the NATO without or against the will of the United States. So NATO is actually United States. And this was actually the reason why it was founded in 1949. The, the, the pre-treaty um, uh, was 1947 
the United States with uh, done with Latin American states for a, a by side uh, a pact that they are uh, defending each other, that they are uh, supporting each other. And the idea was to have a Pax Americana, an, an exclusive influence zone for the United States. And from that treaty, the OAS treaty came, came then later. But this treaty is actually the, the, how you say, the role model it was for the NATO treaty 1949, where uh, uh, United States decided then to build a Pax Americana in Europe that's why transatlantic uh, uh, treaty organization, European and uh, Atlantic. So, but this was the, this is the deal about it, and this is why they are all other vessel states, no allies, because United States is not interested in allies. They are all just vessels. So this is, this is one thing. The second thing is, um, I don't want to comment that much your internal <laughs> issues, but to me, it looks like the choice between pest and cholera sometimes when I look into the United States. So, uh, and I think the reason is that, that the political system is a sick system. It's a false system. It's not democratic. That's the problem, I think. And, uh, and it's a shame uh, for the land of free and democracy that they couldn't manage to have a democratic uh, electoral system. To, to implement such a, a system which is democratic, and um, and the and the and the Europeans, yeah, uh, you told it. The the first general secretary, uh, Lord Ismay, once said the the aim, the goal of the NATO is to keep the Russians out, uh, to to keep the Germans uh, down, and uh, yeah. The thing is now. You can actually say now, 2024, it still uh, keeps the uh, Russians out, but uh, keeps the uh, Europe down. That's what they did, not just Germany. Econ in, 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 in the economically, they are really drowning Europe's economy uh, on, their, on, their, on their own costs, uh, just because of the geostrategic uh, interests of the United States, and this is what they're doing with uh, with uh, the relation to China as well. I mean, they have bombed our infrastructure, uh, our our energy infrastructure. It's the biggest terrorist attack we have seen, and no one is responsible for that, you know. And but although everyone knows who did it, yeah, everyone knows. Talk about the Nord Stream, the Nord Stream pipeline, and. Um, and they didn't do anything. We are paying still four or five times more for energy than the U.S. Americans did. In 2022 and uh, 23, we paid sometimes 14 times more for energy than you guys here in the United States. Why? Because uh, insanity is a ruling in, uh, in Europe against their own interests. They started because the United States wanted uh, a war, an economic war with sanctions against Russia, and they uh, shot in their own uh, uh, knee because we need our industry in Germany, our prosperity. The key of our prosperity in Germany is uh, cheap energy, cheap energy from Russia. That was the key, and the market in, uh, in China, the big market in China. These are the two key uh, issues uh, 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 why we do have such a prosperity, uh, or why, why we have such prosperity in Germany. And now uh, we are drowning because uh, we have 178,000 um, co uh, companies only last year who shut down. 178,000. Our military, uh, our industry, the, the heart of our industry, like uh, chemical industry, BASF, one of the, the biggest in the yeah. world, or some others like the automotive uh, industry, car industry, uh, they are all closing or they are going to uh, uh, abroad to the United States because they have less, they have uh, cheaper energy prices. That is what's going on. And uh, United States is benefiting from this uh, situation. 
because they are uh, losing uh, a competitor like Europe, like Germany, the, the biggest economy there, the strongest economy, not anymore. And, uh, and Europe is uh, losing. And the thing is now, they are pushing Germany and Europe, uh, although China is our biggest trade partner, they are pushing us into a confrontation with China. And the first shot they did was last Friday. They started with uh, shooting at uh, China with sanctions on the electro uh, vehicles they have. And uh, they are talking about overcapacity. Like overcapacity means they're exporting a lot of their cars. I remember that Germany was for years expert world champion for years. We had the most export, uh, uh, export strongest country in the world, Germany was for many years. Yeah. So the Chinese never accused us because of overcapacity, you know, mm -hmm. never uh, uh, accused us. But now they are, uh, they are accusing China to do good cars. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and, and I don't think, yeah, it's cheaper, way cheaper. And, uh, but uh, one missing part is also the logic regarding climate change. They always say, they always pray, we have to protect the climate, the environment, we need better technologies to save the planet. So, okay, then I'm asking myself, why the hell are we now punishing electro uh, cars from China, which are very cheap and very good in the quality, you know, uh, rather than to import them massively right. yeah. to, to have a better, uh, um, how you say, save energy. Save, uh, save in energy and have a better climate. So just, but it shows it's not about climate change. It's not about uh, 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 climate yeah, I don't disagree. I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm just saying. If you have, I, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree on this. I'm just disagreeing in their logic. If they talk about climate change, if they say we have to. The Germans have to buy electronic cars, e-cars, e-vehicles in Germany, I don't know, for 50,000 from Tesla or 80,000 from Tesla. Elon Musk is producing in Germany, in Brandenburg. We have to pay 60, 50,000 for a car rather than to get a one from China for 10 or 15,000. I mean, what's the point of it? I don't understand. I mean, independently from the point that I, I don't think that this is the, the key to challenge climate change. I don't think this, because all the battle is uh, already going on uh, for uh, lithium and everything else you need as minerals for, the, for producing electronic cars. And you need a lot of energy to produce electronic vehicles. But I'm just, uh, I'm just, I just wanted to, uh, to show you it's not about what they say, you know, it's just propaganda. It's a, it's a fight, it's a fight about the decline of the United States. They want to stop their decline and uh, China is rising and they want to cut the relations, the economic relations between Europe, Germany with uh, China because they want us to be more dependent from the United States. Right, and, and, and let's not forget that that wars are the worst for the climate. So yeah. if we really care about the climate, we try to stop wars, yeah. uh, at least at the beginning. And the ones who profited the most from the blowing up of the Nord Stream pipeline are U.S. big oil companies. Yeah. I mean, they're the, one, they're the ones that have absolutely record profits after the blowing up and of the, the pipeline. Fluid, uh, the LNG uh, gas, uh, the, the, the fluid yeah. uh, from LNG. the United States is, uh, yeah, LNG gas. We are importing now this dirty energy from the United States for way more money than we spend for the gas from Russia. And it's really more dirty to produce it, to, uh, to transfer it to, uh, to Europe. And, uh, and this is another proof that it's not about climate when they talk about climate change. And they're destroying this country to get it and ship it through dangerous pipelines to the coast 
to send it there. Yeah, right? in Germany it's forbidden. Fracking is for, forbidden because it is so uh, 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 so against the environment. And uh, it's just insane. We are forbidding fracking gas to produce fracking gas in uh, Germany, but we uh, now buy it from uh, from the United States. And just think what we could be seeing if we didn't see these warmongers meeting in our city. What if they all came together to figure out how can we have good high-speed rail here, not only in the United States, but around the world? So I, I know we're, we're limited on time a little bit, but I wanted to just for a moment be able to look for what can we do as ordinary citizens, as people of this planet, uh, to be able to ward off what you're talking about? Because I don't want people to walk away from here feeling more depressed than they came in. Uh, so uh, are, there, are there things that you feel that people should be doing or are not doing right now? other than you know the usual stuff where you lobby Congress and so on and so forth, and that doesn't seem to get very far. Yeah. So, okay. And then we can open it up for questions for you guys. Well, we always need endless education and activism, uh, and I can think of a couple of good books. You can go out and do some book events and educate people and get them into libraries with. Um, but there is an opportunity for activism here because this country, despite all the trillions of dollars for bombing every corner of the world for democracy, has given almost all power to a single individual. And now that single individual can't string 10 words together. Right. And so there is an opportunity to say to your senators and to your misrepresentatives, on Capitol Hill, we need, especially the ones in the so-called Democratic Party, we need a change, not just because he can't talk, but because he doesn't agree with us, with what we want, with what was in your party platform three and a half years ago, with what the world needs to survive. This is, should be an opportunity, not, you know, it's, it, when, when, you've, when you've put everything into an, an, an imperial presidency uh, and then the emperor, you know, has fallen off the throne. Remember, Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan did more damage when they didn't know their ass from their elbow than when they did, right? Because the, the machine keeps going and it's less accountable when there isn't even a single face. To, to, to hold to anybody's demands. Uh, so we, we cannot go on with, you know, the empty throne and the unaccountable machinery. That's going to be worse than anything that, you know, this corrupt Democratic Party can impose on us as a replacement. But there's an opportunity to demand an actually decent replacement to remind them that cheating Bernie Sanders wasn't a brilliant move on their own terms, right? And that they need to take this moment to give us somebody who comes anywhere close to strong majority opinions on key issues across this country in all the polling, because it's not Joe Biden and it's not Donald Trump. Can yeah, just please. comment uh, your question. I think there is no reason to be depressive. Um, no need to be depressive. No need to be frustrated, because uh, NATO is celebrating the 75th anniversary. But NATO is facing their biggest crisis they ever had. Mm -hmm. They are facing their biggest crisis, and uh, on the one hand side, they have their own crisis with rearmament. Uh, and uh, social uh, war against their own population, and then they're becoming more unpopular in their own populations than the escalation and expansion. But the on, on the other side, and overstretching, that is the crisis why they have this. They're expanding too much, and this is uh, over overstretching. And uh, the other thing is uh, that we have on the other side a rise of a multipolar world order. I mean, the BRICS states, the New Development Bank, 
uh, in, in aiming uh, to de-dollarize the financial, international financial system. It's for me, this is, uh, these are the signs of hope for the future. And uh, we could do everything to, to fasten this process, to fasten this process. This is one thing. Uh, the other thing is, um, Julian once said, Julian Assange once said, if uh, wars, uh, uh, if, if, if lies can help for, for, for wars or uh, make wars uh, possible, then uh, peace can start by truth. That means, um, and there's a saying in, uh, we do have that in Europe at least, that in every war, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the truth is uh, killed. Uh, the first casualty of war is truth. Yeah, I don't agree on this that much because I think the truth is knocked consciousness way before a war starts to make the war possible. And our duty is, from my perspective, to help this truth on, to get on the feet again. This is what we can do, to help the truth get on the feet again against all this propaganda what made the, the war possible. And therefore, I'm very hopefully, and uh, as I told you, the, the criticism is rising in Germany if a majority of the population is not willing to defend other member states. Uh, then they, they are denying actually the duty of the heart, um, the, uh, the essence of the NATO tr uh, treaty. And that's, I think it's a, it's a good sign to work on it. Thank you. Well, in that vein, I think one thing that should really give us hope is that we have global world opinion on our side, even here in the United States where people see through the propaganda to some extent enough so that in uh, October when there was a, uh, a public opinion done, poll done in the United States about uh, Israel and Gaza, we had 66% of the American people saying they want a ceasefire and it's only gone up since then. And the same is true over on Ukraine where you saw back then that there were the majority of people in this country wanted to see a ceasefire. So people in their heart of hearts really don't want to see wars continue. They would rather see peaceful solutions. And the other Who thing cares is- what the people say? Well, but we care what the people say and we're building a global movement. And I think part of that global movement we saw in France recently with the successful beating back of the right, the left yeah. coming to power in France is a very, very positive development. Uh, we see individuals that have meant a lot for us in the anti-war movement over the years, uh, like Jeremy Corbyn in the UK, who got his seat back despite not being allowed to run in his own, what was his own party, the Labour Party. Uh, and we had a tremendous success um, that uh, came recently, and that is in the freedom for Julian Assange. Yes! And in that vein, we are very, very lucky tonight to have with us Julian Assange's brother, Gabriel, who has been working for years to free Julian. So come up and give us a hope. Please give a big hand to Gabriel for all the work he has done to free his brother. Thank you. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, we did it. It can be done. Uh, it can be done. The intelligence community, the military industrial complex can be defeated. Uh, if we all get together and take action, uh, you know, and the perfect example is Julian Assange's freedom. Uh, I was with Julian last week. Uh, you know, we were, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, yeah, I mean, just to be back with him, uh, it's very moving. Obviously, uh, you know, just, it's sort of really hard to explain, you know, just, just standing on a beach with Julian, looking out to sea, and um, after after 14 years of uh, imprisonment, it's such, a, such an incredible moment uh, that, that, you know, we all contributed to, um, especially people on this stage as well, so... Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, there's lots of friendly faces and familiar faces here as well. So, 
Yeah, thanks a lot. I'll just... Maybe I'll just tell you one small anecdote about um, Julian's escape from the United Kingdom. Uh, he was, the United Kingdom didn't want anybody to find out that Julian uh, was leaving, that he, that he was getting out, and so they snuck him out of uh, Belmarsh Prison, the maximum security prison, where he spent the last five years in jail at two o'clock in the morning. He was put inside a prison van, and the prison van driver wasn't even told who he was driving. And uh, he was whisked across London uh, with a police escort. They changed the traffic lights all the way through so that he could drive straight across London at that early time in the morning. He then had to wait outside the Stansted Airport inside the prison van uh, for four hours uh, before the airport uh, opened. Uh, and once the airport opened, he went to the private terminal where they have the, the private jets take off from. He had to fly from Stansted to Bangkok, then to Saipan and, and the US Territory, and then to Australia. And so he was in this waiting room, and there's a few waiting rooms lined up next to each other. And he was sitting in his waiting room with the U, U uh, the ambassador, the Australian ambassador of the United Kingdom and his lawyers. And the waiting room next door started filling up with people. Uh, more and more people kept coming, and he was wondering what's going on. What, you know, why, who's, who's in that waiting room, uh, and why are all these people there? And then he noticed on the fence outside there was all these press photographers lining up. Uh, and he thought, shit, they've found out uh, that someone's leaked, they've found out that I'm here. But it turns out, in the end, uh, that the person next door leaving was Taylor Swift. <laughs> so, so even Taylor Swift played a role in Julian's freedom. So I just want to thank Taylor Swift for covering for Julian. Yeah, he's good. He's he's really good, Tug. I mean, he's you know been with his children and his family. Um, yeah. yeah he's, got, he's got I think some recovery and everything to do, but I think he's still got a fire. You know, he's only 53, so I think he's still got a lot of work to do. So. What is the possibility for a pardon? Well, I, I was I've just been uh, up uh, up on yeah, the hill. The question, the question. Uh, so the possibility of a pardon for Julian. So I was just up on the hill today, and there's a lot. Uh, there's a very strong response from people that you know uh, that the pardon, pardon will be supported. Uh, you know, all the, the groups like ACLU, Freedom of the Press Foundation, have all said to me that they'll support uh, a pardon campaign. So I think there will be a possibility of a pardon. You know, depending on what happens in the election, obviously, but uh, yeah, we're going to push for that, uh, and, and we'll have the support of all our allies uh, in Congress. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, what time is it? It is 7.36, 7.35. All right, so maybe we have time for... Watch the statements of the Minister of Defense, Pistorius, he is now in Washington, or our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annalena Baerbock, uh, from the Greens. She said 2022, uh, the aim of the sanctions is to ruin Russia. That's what she said. It's, uh, it's just a citation. Uh, and, uh, and Chancellor uh, Scholz also then you can, could have the impression, yes, they are preparing for a big war. Um, so for me, it sounds very insane uh, regarding our history. Two times Germany attacked Russia. Yes. First World War and the Second World War. And, uh, and two times Russia defeated. Uh, was undefeated and uh, uh, was defending itself very successfully. Uh, Germany lost, and uh, because of the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Russian war or the proxy war of NATO there in Ukraine, uh, some people uh, started with their revengeist, revisionist views again. It became a little bit more popular in some even mainstream media. 
they have revisionist, revisionist revanchist ideas included in their articles against Russia to mobilize anti-Russian feelings, anti-Russian uh, atmosphere in, in Germany. But uh, uh, the thing is, uh, nevertheless, the population stands for diplomacy and dialogue and for negotiations. I mean, we have such a big, big uh, propaganda uh, and, uh, and it, it's pushed by the transatlantic uh, forces and, uh, uh, and groups. Uh, for example, when I was um, 2022, I was in May in Washington, uh, there is the strategic dialogue, US-American, German strategic dialogue on China. And it's a very exclusive uh, amount of people which is invited to this dialogue. And I was always uh, invited, by the way. I, I don't know why, but <laughs> they did invite me, uh, maybe to pretend democracy, um, at least one critical voice. But the thing was, I, uh, I, uh, I was uh, participating in this meeting and it was very interesting. So two thirds are US Americans and one third are Germans in this uh, dialogue. And there were representatives from the State Department, from Pentagon, from uh, Trade and Commerce Ministry, from the National Security Council and some, uh, and some think tanks. And they were thanking the German press. They said, thanks to the German media, thanks to the German journalists who made it possible that Chancellor Scholz in the German government said yes to weapon deliveries, heavy weapon deliveries to Ukraine. Just imagine, and these journalists are in these transatlantic groups like Atlantic Council, Marshall Fund, and so on. And um, so they, they're pushing us more and more into this confrontation, and these journalists are writing since two years everyday propaganda against Russia, but nevertheless, 55% of the population in Germany is in favor of negotiations uh, and diplomacy with Russia. Even 75% uh, in the east of Germany are against the, so my 55% are also against the NATO membership for Ukraine and uh, 75 in the east of Germany. This, this is uh, in rise. And the other thing is, because of the social cuts we have, because, uh, I mean, caused by the war, uh, because we are sending weapons uh, rather than uh, giving our children good education, um, so the people are getting more and more upset in, in Germany. So that I hope, I mean, we had in France these elections, uh, it's a big success uh, for the left in, in, in France. Alain is from, uh, from France. Uh, from the Popular Front, it's a big success, and I hope this could, uh, yeah, this this could uh, this could help to to have a change in Germany or other states uh, in in Europe as well. So uh, we're we're really running short of time. So why don't we have you ask, uh, and then I think you had your hand. So maybe the two of you ask those questions uh, both, and then we'll have uh, final comments from them, if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, I'm still puzzled as to why. Europe is acting the way that it's acting. Um, is it that certain sectors are profiting off the current course, the financial and military sectors? Does the NSA have compromising information on key European officials or what? Um, that's one. But Article 5, I was a bit puzzled by your remarks about that. It's my understanding that they don't Article 5 opens the door to the possibility of broader war, but it doesn't mandate it. So I think there should be some clarification about it. Sorry? Uh, sorry, this thing is cutting off. I didn't cut it off. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I get enough of that. I know. <laughs> so, um, the, um, I, I found the discussion very elucidating, um, but I think there is a symbiotic relationship. Am I, am I something I shouldn't? Thank you. 
it, um, are, I view them as being in a symbiotic relationship, which is why I put forward a very practical thing that anybody can do, which is vote back. Would be Biden voters, would be Trump voters, pair up and both vote for non-genocidal, non-pro-NATO candidates. You're not helping either one of them if you do it in pairs. It's a very strategic form of voting. Um, and it's something that anybody can do. Find the Marjorie Taylor Green in your life <laughs> and both bail out of uh, this, uh, this system. So I'll just use, I don't need a mic. Go ahead. Am I loud enough or you want me to? Yeah, if it works, it's better. All right, so I basically have the same point as this gentleman here at the end. You said, I believe we should pressure the Democratic leadership to appoint somebody who represents the American public. I don't know who that is in the Democratic Party. Every single Democrat in Congress voted for Hakeem Jeffries, the congressman from Wall Street and APAC and the military industrial complex to be their leader. Isn't it time that we on the pro-peace, pro-worker, pro-poor, pro-struggling American vote for and unite in support of Jill Stein? Oh, yeah! <laughs> all right, so uh, if we can have some uh, closing comments from you, uh, I'll just, from all three of you. I, uh, I'll just try to make it very short. Uh, this is a question, what I've got in the last, uh, in the recent years, especially from the Global South, why is Europe, why the hell are they so dumb to do this uh, politics against their own interests? Um, the, the thing is, we are run by uh, corporate media, uh, which is cooperated in this transatlantic groups, um, like I said, Atlantic Council, German Marshall Fund, blah, blah. Uh, like this uh, dialogue I, I, uh, I attended three years ago where the U.S. Uh, Pentagon is saying thank you to the German journalists uh, for their work they have done. Like, uh, they applaud them, well done. And, and uh, the other thing is, we are run by a lot of politicians which are in this uh, transatlantic think tanks. They went through the training of World Economic Forum or German Marshall Fund or some others, they went really through a training. So when I talked to them, I'm a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the German Parliament, and when they start to speak about an issue, I always have the impression they have a handout from the Pentagon, they are reading. So that's my impression. And the third thing is with the economy. So. People asking themselves why the German economy is not protesting against this politics because it's against their own interests. The thing is, German economy is not the German economy uh, any longer. So the biggest shareholders of the 40 stock exchange German companies are US American companies like BlackRock. Right. BlackRock is ruling the most of the German big uh, companies, like the military industrial complex Rheinmetall, for example. Rheinmetall, you, you think it's a German uh, 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 weapon manufacturer. Yeah, but the, one of the biggest shareholders is BlackRock. They are profiting from that as well. And, uh, and the other sectors, like um, car or some other uh, sectors in, 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 in Germany, are the Americans. They are the biggest shareholder and they are the biggest decision maker in the companies so you can understand so you can you can yeah you can understand how the decisions are uh, made in the in the companies and why they are subservient uh, to this uh, to this approach by the pol politics uh, um, so normally you can say economy beats politics. No, it's the other way around. Politics beats economy. They're doing what politics says, and the politics is cooperated with transatlantic um, transatlantism as well as the media does. That's the reason why Europe is doing these policies. Um, 
on the on the topic of elections, you know, I think, and it's very very hard uh, for all of us, including me, but I think the first thing we have to do is focus on nonviolent activism, which has always changed the world far more than elections especially in a place that has a completely corrupt electoral system where it's not fair and open to get names on the ballot, to get names in debates, to get names in the media. Uh, it's absolutely rotten to the core. I'm not against elections. I think we should have one someday. Uh, at the moment, we do not. But my God, yes, Jill Stein is one of us. She's a friend, she's an ally of many, many years. I've learned many, many things from her. She's brilliant, she's dedicated, she's been viciously smeared and lied about. She, I mean, she, she had the, the kindness to once ask me if I'd like to be vice president, and I didn't want to be, but, uh, <laughs> but she, yeah, of course, if you want to vote for someone I mean, nobody should vote for Trump or Biden, my God. Right. Uh, but if you want to vote for somebody good, she's somebody good. But you know, I mean, I could take one of these books and throw it and I would hit somebody a thousand times better than Trump or Biden. It's, it's not a, a high bar. Uh, the only other thing I want to say uh, is that NATO has done us a, a big favor. They have these, they have these, uh, conferences once a year in a different part of the world each year and they've told us where they're going to have it next year and he opened this event by pointing out what criminals NATO is we point this out in the book uh, what criminals they are and they are going out of their way to make things convenient for us their next meeting will be June 24th to 26 2025 in The Hague where they need to be arrested and prosecuted, and we should be there. There will be more than 10 people on the street like there were today. There I will be today. thousands and thousands. Yeah, I mean, that does bring up that NATO is a bigger issue in Europe than it is here. In fact, our biggest problem in organizing around NATO is that people really even don't know what it is. Um, but Europe, it is a big issue, and our European friends here, we thank you for the great work that you have been doing, uh, and Alain here, that you have been doing to organize in Europe. And yes, we can get a lot more people out in Europe than we can in the United States on NATO. Um, but um, you, you had, um, Sam, you had mentioned Article 5. You wanted some clarity on that. Article 5 does not say you have to send in troops and join in a war if a NATO country is attacked. It says you have to uh, take appropriate measures and you can decide those appropriate measures. Um, but the fact that it has only been invoked one time, and that's after 9-11 from the United States, means that they take that very seriously and that um, it, it is a very uh, major step to take to invoke Article 5. And uh, as we wrap up and talk about the need for education, we hope you'll buy the book and we'd love to sign it for you. Um, but I do want to end on a positive note about education. And this is something I was talking to Gabriel about yesterday and it stuck in my mind and I hope I'm not giving away your next film. Uh, but you did talk about how many of our best journalists, podcasters, reporters have left the mainstream media and have found a way to make a living themselves by listener-supported or viewer-supported platforms. And this is giving us a chance not only to just scroll on social media and find things like what's happening in Gaza, but to really get good analysis from people who are giving us the non-corporate perspective. They're not beholden to big corporations to pay their salaries or to billionaires like Bezos. These are people who are supported by us, by the people, by the listeners. And I think this will transform things for us and really help to educate millions of people. And I wanna say in closing, the one of the thing that gives me hope was not only the encampments of so many young people around this country uh, for uh, supporting Gaza and the Palestinian people, but the clarity that so many of them had and have 
that this is not just about an issue of Gaza. This is about fighting a much, much bigger war machine. And so we have a young generation that is getting to understand what some of us learned back in the 60s and 70s, that we have to fight the war machine, and that's what we're doing together. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists, uh, David, thank you, Seven, thank you, and of course, Medea, thank you all for coming. And <clears throat> tomorrow night, there's a uh, film showing that we'll be doing at 14th Street. It's uh, <clears throat> by Al Jazeera Fault, Fault Lines. It's called The Night Won't End. Yes. And it's about uh, families that, uh, that have lost many, many people during this war at the hands of the IDF who have been killed. And it follows those uh, three or four families that talk about the targeting of civilians by the IDF. Uh, we're going to have Josh Paul, uh, will be one of the panelists, uh, who's the, uh, the State Department, uh, uh, is it resignee? Is that, is that yeah, a, a person that resigned from the State Department uh, over this war? I'm sorry? Whistleblower, maybe. Uh, whistleblower. And uh, we, have, uh, we have Josh Rushing, who's the host of Fault Lines. And, uh, and uh, Sharif Abdul Qadus, who is one of the producers of the show. So we encourage you to be there. I'm going to give the microphone to Anne for final words. Well, we want to thank uh, everyone on our panel for an excellent, excellent uh, discussion about the, the pros, no, no pros, cons, <laughs> cons of NATO. Yeah, the cons, a lot of cons. Uh, there. There's a lot of cons up there. That's right. But we, you're, NATO's going to be here for another two days, so we need everybody who can get out on the streets to do something. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow morning, if you want to come over to the uh, uh, convention center, we don't know quite where we will be because they're going to lock the gates to the fences, and we, we don't know quite where, where we'll be. Probably on the south side of like Apple, you know, the Apple Carnegie Library thing. We'll, tr we'll start out on the south side and then we'll probably circle around and see what it is. The Marquee Marriott is close by and that's where the non-public public meetings are gonna be. And then tomorrow night, there are going to be three opportunities for us to be at various places. And we can sort out who wants to go to the State Department to be there to tell bloody Blinken, you know, no more genocide and all the foreign ministers. We can go to the White House and that's where the heads of government will be at the White House with President Bloody Biden. And then we can go to Fort McNair and that's where the foreign um, the ministers of defense will be with uh, Lloyd Austin, uh, our Secretary of Defense. So are there other things during the day that we can remember? Congress. And of course Congress. Every day going back into that evil mean Congress. So if you want to do that, it's 10 o'clock at the Rayburn Cafeteria to meet them. Any other things that people have noted during the course of the day for tomorrow? in Washington. Well, again, let's give our, our, our authors, our book people, a big round of applause. We're going to have both David and Medea come sit over here.